and start recording. Okay. Uh, do you have any questions, Zane? Um, I, I have about six pages on the report for the book this week. I can cut it a little bit. Uh, I just, I kind of put my heart and soul. So I just want to make sure six and a half isn't too much. No, no, no. Don't worry. I never penalize a student for writing more. So I know some teachers record a specific set of numbers, but no, if you go more than that, I mean, not too much. Right. right. <laughs> uh, it's fine with me. Uh, so, uh, and I think you will find uh, that book very helpful for your understanding and ministry. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, hopefully other will join us, but I wanted to share a few things based upon grading the quizzes and discussions. Uh, and if you have any other question, please feel free to ask. Uh, but a few things I wanted to share. One regarding that scripture memory verse, Colossians 2.9, which says um, that in him, uh, for in him all the fullness of de deity dwells in bodily form. The importance of that verse is specifically in reaching out to uh, the Baha'i people uh, is that that actually that that verse and the whole Colossian the epistle of Colossians is a response to Gnostic heresy. Gnostic heresy that has influenced the churches in Colossians area. And, um, you know, a typical characteristic, as I mentioned in that a video presentation that I had on Gnosticism is a typical characteristic of now Gnosticism is that that they believe there is this um, one God, monad God, absolute unity, and there are these manifestations from this one God coming down to the physical world. And uh, people like these spiritual leaders or prophets. Uh, such as, uh, hi Joshua, uh, like uh, um, uh, Abraham, Moses, Muhammad, Baha'u'llah, and Jesus, they are all a manifestation of that monad God. Now that verse, and these, these come from, you know, this is what actually the Baha'i believe, and this verse uh, in Colossians is a response to Gnosticism, so it gets to the root of the problem. And he says, no, Jesus is not a manifestation of God. But actually, I always say that in our church, that Jesus is not a manifestation of God, but he is God manifested. In him, there is a fullness of deity. And that's the important significance, importance and significance of that verse in reaching out to the Baha'i people. Because they think, if you tell them, Jesus is the son of God. They said, fine. Um, Muhammad was the son of God. Baha'u'llah was the son of God. Moses was the son of God. And they are, are sparks from divinity. And the response is, no, they are not. And even Jesus, the Lord Jesus, he's not a spark of divinity. He is God manifested in human flesh. As this verse says, the word the fullness peleroma in Greek means, you know, complete fullness. So it describes, um, it wants to describe the totality of something. Uh, in Christ, there's a totality of uh, divinity. He doesn't lack anything as far as divinity is concerned. And that's, I think, is a significant verse in reaching out to Baha'is. Any question on that? No? Okay. Then uh, the other thing I wanted to mention again, <clears throat> these are the things I've, I've seen on the uh, quizzes and grading the discussion regarding uh, uh, witnessing to the Muslim. Uh, you know, um, I have no problem with uh, critical critical contextualization of the gospel for Muslim or for anybody. The, uh, but by critical contextualization, which in fact, Dr. Hebert, uh, who is the editor of that book for the graduate student, he's the uh, 
main one of the main editor for this book, Understanding the Folk Religion. Uh, he has another book called um, Anthropological Insight for Missionaries, excellent book. I use that for my course on cultural anthropology. Um, he talks about critical contextualization, meaning uh, we want to make the gospel understandable for people of other cultures. Uh, we define terms, but we don't change them. Uh, and we don't mix them up with other things. For example, if a Muslim uh, doesn't understand, which usually they don't, uh, the term Jesus being the son of God, we explain that, what we mean by that. And I let me tell you, I believe that the best response to that comes from the scripture itself. And that's Hebrews chapter one, verse three. That's Hebrew, Hebrews 1, 3 is the best verse, uh, best response for explaining uh, the sonship of Christ because it says it itself. So the son is the radiance of God's glory and exact representation of his being. So when they ask us, uh, what, does the, why do you, what do you mean by saying Jesus is the son of God? I just quote that verse. I said, this is exactly what I mean. Uh, this is what the word of God says. But, you know, regarding, you know, I noticed some in their discussion that some of the students mentioned like um, um, copying Muslim rituals. For example, um, uh, Muslim pray uh, toward Mecca a certain number of times per day. And they were saying some, there are some missionaries who say, well, we can do the same thing, but not toward Mecca or not toward Allah. We can pray toward, you know, offer our prayer toward God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> That's fine. But I think still, I will caution that, you know, it's, you know, of course, it's, um, we, we must pray toward the right God, definitely. <clears throat> but I will caution imitating or copying Muslim rituals, such as, you know, when they stand up, they bow down and all that, because we can, uh, inevitably, we can confuse them. You know, we are not, we know what we are doing. We know, <coughs> excuse me, we are offering our prayer to uh, the triune God. We know that, but we can, uh, maybe unconsciously uh, cause a stumbling block for a Muslim because they don't know what's in our heart and they, they may start thinking that, oh, we are praying to same God. We are not. The God of Islam and the God of the, the Bible, they are not the same God, even though in Arabic Bible, it uses the word Allah. And that is, in my opinion, is misfortunate and comes from, you know, back in the 18th century from uh, missionaries who went to uh, Islamic countries and they were involved in translation of the uh, scripture into Arabic language. They chose Allah. Now, I don't make a big deal out of it. I, I don't have a problem of using the word Allah for God provided that we define the content that, and also we, uh, we make it clear that the Allah of the Bible is not the same as Allah of the Quran. Um, so uh, you just have to be careful about um, trying to copy um, Muslim rituals. When I was student at Trinity, I remember one time I was, um, you know, they had a very good collection of uh, per periodicals and some of them from, um, you know, these different religious group and from Muslim organization. And I was, I used to read a magazine from an Islamic organization. And in fact, I believe I have a copy of it. Maybe I will uh, scan it and put it on the uh, popularly. Uh, the author was warning Muslim. He's saying that be uh, careful and be aware of 
uh, Christian missionaries new tactic and this is old you know I, I was at Trinity back in 1986 through 1989 so this is uh, more than 30 years old and and even then he said you know the author was saying that these most uh, Christian missionaries now they are using new terminology they want to use Islamic terminology to deceive us uh, like uh, they say they don't call the church a church uh, they call it the mosque of Jesus or the mosque of Isa, as the, the word Jesus is pronounced in Arabic, uh, and many things like that. And, and the conclusion of the author was this, he made two conclusions. First of all, he said that these Christians are being deceptive. And, and secondly, why are they ashamed of their faith, why they don't come and say straightforward who they are and what they believe. And I, I, and I agree with him. Uh, we shouldn't be deceptive. You know, it's like, how do we feel uh, when Mormons or Jehovah Witnesses, they come at our door and they say, we are Christians. <laughs> and we who are Christian will tell them, no, you're not. <laughs> but they go to our neighbors and in our neighborhood and they say we are Christians and they try to um, bring people into their cult. Now we don't like it. We find, we feel that they are misusing the name of Christ and Christianity. It's the same way when we do that toward Muslim. When we try to uh, um, cover up under some Islamic rituals our true intention. Um, any question so far? No? Okay. No, just the, the reading mentioned some of those tactics, um, even in this week's reading, maybe like when speaking to some of the African groups as missionaries, taking on some of the names of their deities, their supreme deities, when trying to relate with God. So you're saying that's not a tactic that should be taken? No, no. Okay, you see... I understand using the name of deity. You know, I have a, I had a student in one of my classes uh, for uh, the master degree in intercultural studies, and he's a missionary in Japan, and he told me that the word for God in Japanese Bible is, um, um, uh, if I remember the word, oh, kami. Um, a kami, kami, yeah, exactly, uh, is the word kami, which is a name of a deity in Shintoism. Um, and I asked him, is there a problem to use that? And he said, no, because we define the content, we define this kami, that it becomes very, very clear that it's not the kami of uh, Shintoism. And and see, there, and this is kind of um, uh, situation that we are in. It's I will call it the corruption of the language, because if we try to use another word, uh, people will not understand. I mean, if you try to even you know somebody, I remember someone has suggested that we could have used the Hebrew names of God uh, for uh, different cultures. Yeah, but again, even for, I mean, imagine if for a Japanese try to use the word Elohim or Yahweh, uh, it will take centuries, it will take years before they could understand what uh, we are talking about. So, uh, again, it's not the use of these words. It's a copying the rituals. I don't have a problem with the word Kami or with the word Allah. But I do have a problem if we try to make Christian uh, prayer uh, like uh, a Muslim prayer. I, I, I do have a problem with that. Even though in our hearts we are praying uh, to the right God. Uh, you know, um, in fact, if you read Mark chapter 7, it's an interesting thing. We are doing a study of that in our church. Mark 7, verses 1 through 13, uh, basically the point that Jesus is making that verse, he's talking about the empty, wor empty worship, 
and he's saying, the point he's making is this, that you can pray to the right God, but in a wrong way. <laughs> and that, you know, of course, in that context, he's talking about the hypocrisy and ritualism of the Pharisees and Judaism of his time. But the principle can be applied in many different uh, situations, such as uh, uh, making Christian worship or Christian prayer similar to Muslim worship or Muslim prayer. And again, you know, here is a one distinction, like if there's a congregation of believers like we have in our church, there are believers from Iran, uh, some from Afghanistan, and they came from Islamic background, but they are now Christians. They are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the hymn that we use, the type of music, some of these things come from our culture. What we do not uh, mix in anything Islamic or, or, or any other religion into our worship because that's not right. That's not biblical. Uh, but to use cultural things, I don't have a problem with that, provided that we understand what we are doing. And again, uh, I would go, you know, the, the best thing, the best book on that is Dr. Hibbert book on anthropological, anthropological insight for missionary. Uh, it's a book that I use for my cultural anthropology class. And he has a whole chapter on critical contextualization. Uh, and that means that you look at a culture and you see what are the things in that culture that must be rejected. Uh, there are things that are bad. There are things that are evil, sinful in all cultures. And we must reject them. Gospel is against them. There are some elements that they are not uh, anti-biblical, but they need to be uh, redefined in a biblical terms. And we do that. Like one of the things that we do that in our church, you know, in uh, March 21st, around that time, is the Iranian or Persian New Year. It's basically a spring equinox. Now, the roots of it may go, it, in that maybe it does go back to uh, Zoroastrianism. But uh, we celebrate the new year, uh, and not only in our church or in, in Iran, not as a uh, remembrance of Zoroastrianism, but just as a national holiday, as a national uh, new year. And, um, uh, you know, we have this celebration, uh, like there is, there's a table that people, uh, you know, traditionally you put a specific items like uh, green grass for uh, wishing that the year be a, 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 a green and a fruitful year, fruits, different things. And, uh, and non-Christians, uh, Muslim, for example, they put a copy of Quran. Now, we, we don't put a copy of Quran on that table. We put a copy of Bible. And we thank God when we make all of our prayers very clearly to God the Father. You know, the problem I had with that tactic of praying in our heart to, the, to God the Father is that, okay, uh, <clears throat> people cannot hear what's in my heart. <laughs> That's the problem I have with that uh, approach. Uh, we make it clear that we are worshiping Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay. Uh, one offshoot of that, Professor. I'm trying to think. Uh, I, I just thought of of using a verbal prayer as a as a tool, and of course, I'm. Countering, counterbalancing that with Matthew six and don't let anyone anybody know that you're praying. So I'm, I'm. This is kind of my knee jerk reaction. I'm just, I'm, I never thought of it. I never thought of using uh, verbal, audible prayer as a tool for evangelism to show. No, and I, and in fact, um, I think prayer should not be, be be. I think that if we try to use it as a tool of evangelism, we are misusing prayer. Prayer oh, okay. is 
offering our heart the, to, to God. I'm speaking to God. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Now that makes sense. Yeah. You know, that's a, these are some of the things that we, <laughs> we have to be careful. You know, sometimes in prayer meeting, I've noticed like people want to say something to somebody else and they say it in a prayer <laughs> yeah. format. Oh. <laughs> yeah. 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 I have my own, ver my own stories. Uh, um, I, okay, one thing with um, with using the name of the deity of a local culture, I'm trying to I'm trying to put myself in that those shoes of say if, say I'm a barbarian, and or you know I'm I'm someone who doesn't have Christ. What I mean by that, uh, and a missionary comes and they use the name Zeus or they use the name Odin, um, uh, you know, versus like the term for judge or ruler, you know, a generic term for God. I, I'm I'm still digesting it because but I thought you know, I was on board. I'm still you know, on board. You know, you know I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because you see the term Zeus, the Greek name for God, Theos, the roots of it comes from that. <laughs> in fact, and in, in fact, the word God that we use in English, it, it comes from old Germanic word, Guden, and in fact, from the word Odin that you just mentioned. These are uh, some of the, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, you know. so, you know, what I'm trying to say is, I know some people have very strong feeling regarding the use of um, uh, names of deity. But to be honest with you, unless <laughs> we use Hebrew names, there is nothing, I mean, all, in all languages, whether English, whether um, Germanic or Persian, Arabic, Japanese, we all have corrupted words for deity because of these false religions. And um, unless we want to go back only to the Old Testament and use of the names of God in the, in the Hebrew language, uh, they all have some kind of problem, even the word God, even the word, you know, the word uh, Zeus, Theos, uh, Odin, um, the word God comes from that. Um, um, mm, you know, like the word Thursday in our language, mm -hmm. you, it comes from the name Tors, one of the name of uh, gods in Greek mythology. But, so my point is this, Mm, let's not get bogged down on the the label, but just let me let's make sure that the content is biblical, so that the people can understand. But I don't, for example, I don't make the church worship look like a mosque worship. Now I have a problem with that because I think no, that, that, that's not a critical contextualization. I don't uh, uh, tell people, let's pray toward Mecca. <laughs> Even we, in our heart, we may say, okay, we are praying toward Jerusalem. Uh, but come on, this is like a, you know, um, playing with words. Um, you know, the ritualism of it, you know, I don't call the church the mosque of Jesus because the term mosque has a very specific connotation. Uh, and the, the, the reason that I think missionaries in the 18th century picked the, net, the word Allah for uh, trans, in translation of the word God in Arabic was, uh, I mean, if they wanted to use anything else, it would be very difficult to, to communicate the gospel. So they picked the name, but they changed the content. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, is one more thing is, is mm, okay regarding again buzz let's go back to the Baha'i faith well one of but you know and the discussion question was the attraction of the Baha'i faith in America um, you guys, you all did great, and you know, yes, it's attract, attraction, it's inclusion, it's political correctness, accepting everything, and a kind of very 
supposedly on the surface very democratic religion that we accept everybody but in reality they don't they only what they do they take these religious belief and they distort them uh, into their own format and they present it in a way that fits into their system that's the only way that they accept these religions and their tool is a is what the tool that they use for that purpose is a strange system of hermeneutics that they have i have talked with a number of baha'i people because of my work among iranian you know there's a good number of iranian baha'is even right here in san diego area and by the way if there are people who are in this area and wanted to visit a Baha'i center. There is a Baha'i center on Linda Vista. Uh, uh, and their, their system of hermeneutic is allegorical, but a very strange allegorical. You know, for example, I know Christians, um, uh, especially in the reform camp, that they use allegory. But they, even though I don't agree with that, and even though I think that you will, if you use that system to a system of hermeneutic, eventually you end up with some kind of a, uh, a wrong interpretation. But the Baha'i's allegorical system is way offline. I mean, it's just an extreme allegorical system uh, in a way that they twist and change the format of uh, everything to fit into their system. You know, I've talked with them. They say if there is a contradiction between the Bible and the Quran or any other book, it's because you are focusing on the surface area. You are focusing on the literal level. You need to go deep into a spiritual sense. And basically, when you do that, it means you can make make up whatever you want to make out of the text. So uh, they come uh, with this a strange format of um, uh, you know interpretation of scripture, and uh, you know again we have to remember that the roots of Baha'i faith goes back to Gnosticism. And in Gnosticism, there is this idea that they all, all religions are coming. There are sparks, manifestation of that monad God. Um, and, and I mentioned in my comment on the discussion question that you may be surprised, but I find the followers of the Baha'i faith even more um, fanatic about their faith more than the Muslim far more than the Muslim. I find the Muslim far more open to hear the gospel than the Baha'i. And there are, there are two reasons, I believe there are two, maybe there are others, but there are two things that comes to my mind to explain that behavior. And one is that they've been traditionally and historically, they've been persecuted. Uh, the Baha'is are heavily persecuted in Iran, Persia, and in all Muslim countries. So, you know, when you are a persecuted group, you tend to uh, uh, become ingrown and you tend to um, stick with one another and become very defensive regarding to your fate. And also lots of them, majority of them are converts. And usually, uh, you know, if, when you're a convert to something, uh, you are more um, militant about your new faith or new belief. So uh, I think these are the two reasons of their, why they are so fanatical about their uh, faith. Um, I have seen some to come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but in comparison to the Muslims, far less, far, far less. Uh, in fact, as I said, Muslims are far more open to the gospel than the Baha'i. Um, any question? Anything? No? All right. Okay. Let's also mention a few things regarding the supposed 
the influence of Zoroastrianism on Old Testament. Uh, let me get, uh, okay, let me, maybe I can go to the share screen. Uh, okay, here. Okay, I hope you can see that. Um, I believe you should, yeah. Uh, you know, you see, this is one of the attacks or criticism from liberal uh, Christianity and liberals in general against the integrity of the Bible and Christian faith that they say Old Testament has been influenced by Zoroastrianism and copy things from Zoroastrian religion, which most of you responded very well to that uh, accusation based upon our textbook. And the fact is this, that Zoroastrianism um, uh, became the uh, religion of the Persia from late sixth century BC onward, at the time that the Jews were in exile in Babylon. Uh, you know, first of all, Zoroastrianism wasn't in Babylon, was in Persia and even, and in Persia even, uh, became the dominant religion much later. So the Jews in Babylon, they hadn't had contact with Zoroastrianism to be influenced by it. And, um, and you know, Zoroaster, he was a contemporary of Jeremiah and Daniel. So by his time, uh, even though at his time, Zora, his um, new faith wasn't predominant in Persia or Babylon, for that matter, uh, Judaism was well established. And if there are similarities, if there are similarities between Zoroastrianism and Old Testament, I think the, it's a, a, a other way around. The influence, it's, it's, it's the fact that Judaism, the Old Testament has influenced Zoroastrianism, not other way around. Um, any question regarding that? No? Okay. Now, last, last thing I wanted to talk about, and if you have any question, please feel free to ask. Uh, part of our reading, I also ask you to read about some areas on Christian doctrines. I'd like to hear from you. How would you define the doctrine of the Holy Trinity? Because... There is so much confusion, even among good churches, even among evangelical Christians, you know, their understanding of doctrine of Holy Trinity. Lots of time I notice people uh, uh, unknowingly, not, uh, not, you know, not intentionally, uh, they fall into uh, one of the his historical heresy regarding doctrine of Trinity, such as modalism. Could you... Uh, I'd like to hear from you guys. How would you define the doctrine of Holy Trinity? As simple as one God, three persons. And resist the urge to try to explain it too much. Because, yeah, then I'll get into uh, water, ice, and, and mist analogies. And that's not that's not what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, one God, three persons. And... Professor Serrato wouldn't even let me say three personalities, just three persons. Yeah, yeah, three persons. Yeah, yeah. How about you, Joshua? Similar. I mean, it is hard to explain. I mean, I've heard the different things like Shakespeare writing himself into a story and, and things like that. I tend to shy away from that one because we're talking about an author writing fiction. Um, so it's, it's not a perfect explanation. Yeah, one God, three persons, the way that he, he interacts with and represents himself um, with, with humanity, I guess. But, I mean, we read John, and it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word, you know, was with God. So it sounds like there's, a, a, I know it's one God, but it sounds like on a spiritual level, like a dualism in regards to representation at that moment. Um, you know, and so I'm not talking about two. I'm not talking about polytheism. I'm just saying it's hard to probably hard to define in humanistic terms with our limited finite minds and understanding so yeah yeah you see here is the point that 
uh, let me first give you know give the uh, you know you get you guys were right you know, first me let me give you the my uh, brief uh, statement in fact it's this is not explanation this is a statement in fact uh, when i teach the church history uh, i mentioned that you know things when you come to the creeds of church history on issues regarding you know when they were trying to um, uh, discuss the Holy Trinity, they didn't come with the explanation of the Holy Trinity. They came with the uh, definition. They came with a statement. And because you cannot explain it, it is beyond human ability and knowledge. But the definition is this, like you said, we believe in one God, that in that oneness, there is a complexity. There are three persons, not personality, but persons which they are distinct from one another. Uh, father is not the son. The son is not the father. The Holy Spirit is not the son or the father. And they coexist from eternity past to eternity in future. And they don't convert to one another the father doesn't become the son or the son doesn't become the holy spirit and all these uh, clauses are put there for avoiding the historical errors that has happened in throughout the church history you know the the, the uh, famous heresy of mo modalism wants to say okay there is this one god that sometimes becomes the father sometimes because the Son sometimes become the, becomes the Holy Spirit. There is another form of modalism that says, okay, uh, God like is in a process of evolution. He started as a father, then he became the son. Now he's the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you, there is this, I don't know if you know about this group. Have you ever heard the name Witness Lee? Have you ever heard of him? No. How about Watchman Me? No. Good. <laughs> I'm glad. Okay. Both of these guys. Uh, Witness Lee was a student of Watchman Me, and as you can tell from their name, they're Oriental. They're from Chinese background. Now, uh, Watchman Me was okay, but I still have some problem with some of his teaching. But Witness Lee, in my opinion, was completely off, off line and um, he was uh, heretical. And uh, there are his followers in our time. The name of their group, they changed their name uh, because uh, every so often people will recognize them and they have to change their name. Uh, uh, um, in maybe 30, 40 years ago, they used to call them the local church the local church. Now they change their name. They call themselves the Living Water Ministry, something like that. Uh, I'm not sure exactly. Uh, I mean, uh, I may be wrong on, on the exact name, but they are basically a form of modalism. And they have, a, they have their Bible called uh, Recovered Bible or something like this. Or recovery Bible, um, and you know, I I used to go to uh, campus of San Diego State witnessing, and I remember seeing one time I saw these guys over there, and they had they were giving this um, copy of their Bible. Now the text is okay, the text is like our Bible, but under the text maybe there were this much verses from the Scripture, and then there were this much uh, uh, commentary by Witness Lee. And they focus more on the commentary written by Witness Lee than the war, the scripture itself. And one of the things, like, you know, I talked one time with one of them, uh, one of the followers of this, I call them a cult because they deny Trinity. Uh, uh, Witness Lee has this in writing that when Jesus was crucified, he uh, crucified Satan in his flesh. Now, I talked to this guy. I said, well, you know, 
what do you mean by that? I mean, do you, do you understand what you're saying? And he was saying that, well, yeah, in his flesh, Satan was crucified. Then I said, well, okay, do you know what's the implication of that statement? The implication is this, that the Lord Jesus in his physical body, he had a demon, he had a uh, Satan in his physical body. That's what you're saying. And that's blasphemy. Uh, so we didn't get anywhere in our talk. Uh, but if you understand all these uh, teaching, the roots of them, you can then comprehend them. Again, uh, these people, like um, many others, like Arius in the uh, fourth century, uh, who, who is a forefather of the Jehovah's Witnesses, they were influenced by Gnosticism. That's the reason I called Gnosticism mother of all heresy. And in Gnostic teaching, anything physical is evil, anything spiritual is good. So that's the reason the guys come and write unknowingly that Jesus crucified Satan in his physical flesh because flesh is bad. And in their church, in their group, they think God was the father, then evolved to the son, and now he's only the Holy Spirit. So things are moving toward a spiritual issue. Uh, I don't know if I'm making sense to you guys or not. I hope so. Uh, uh, um, but basically, you know, remember, there's one God uh, in three persons, distinct from one another, from eternity past, they coexisted and they do coexist to eternity future and they don't convert to one another. Um, more than that, if you want to go, we can end up into some kind of trouble. I, I like to study, you know, books on the doctrine of Trinity. But, you know, I, I, I mentioned that in last time I was teaching church history that you, you see most, most errors in church history, in church doctrine comes from when we step upon the holy ground. You know, when uh, Moses had that encounter with the Lord the, at the burning bush, with the experience of the burning bush, the Lord told him, Moses, take off your sandal because the ground that you're standing upon is the holy ground. And when we come to the mm, teachings like the doctrine of Holy Trinity, we stand up on the holy ground. And the only thing that we can do is like Moses to bow down and worship. So sometimes some of the best expression of uh, Holy Trinity, you find them not in books, but in our hymns, old hymns of the church, sometimes they are so deep and rich in their theological um, uh, content. Uh, and that's where you find uh, some of the best uh, definition, not explanation, of the Holy Trinity, which is basically worship. There's not much we can do. And I come to that verse, Deuteronomy 29.29, 29, which says, the secret things belongs to the Lord. These are, this is one of them. Uh, we can understand to a degree the doctrine of Holy Trinity, but not in its fullness, uh, because you got to be God in order to do that. Uh, but what we must do is bow down and worship the destroying God. Um, that's all I had to share. If you guys have any comment, questions, Um, oh, sorry, you go ahead. Josh, go ahead. I was going to oh, say better, yeah. into, into uh, some of the African religion reading. So if yours is still on subject, do you want to go first? Uh, you go for it first. We're, we'll have another politeness debate. You're fine. Go for it. Okay. Hey, uh, just for clarification, in the, the African religions reading, the is it Maasai warriors? M-A-A-S-A-I? Maasai? Um, these were the ones that practice circumcision at puberty for a rite of passage, and then they yeah. dress up the, the, like girls until they're healed. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just to clarify, it, it appears that so those warriors, the Messiah warriors, 
I just want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly because it seems like they're kind of like, well, in our culture, pedophiles, the warriors would be, if I'm reading it right, because it says that they're living a life of privilege. They, uh, they live in communally and specially designated crawls. The warriors enjoy the love of girls who have not been circumcised. And so the circumcision no. was done for girls that were, that had reached puberty. So yeah. by love, is it talking about the yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so these male warriors are spending time with underage girls, and that's yes, yes, a life of luxury and privilege for them. Yes, yes, that's true. And this is one of the things that I mentioned in critical contextualization. There are things that we must reject. Uh, you find, you know, I remember a um, few years ago. I don't know if you guys remember. There was this um, controversy in Afghanistan. Uh, among the military over there. American military personnel, they um, complain to commanders or to the Pentagon. Uh, and in fact, it, it went all the way to President Obama and he had to interfere, which he didn't do a good job at all, in my opinion, uh, that some of these Afghan uh, military leaders, Afghan military commanders, they were doing the same thing. They were having uh, children coming for them for sexual purposes. And in fact, boys, you know, we are talking about uh, homosexuality and little, you know, on little boys. And American personnel, they couldn't, I mean, it was unacceptable. They said, well, this is, this is wrong. We, we cannot ha have something like this in our, at our bases. And there was quite a controversy. And unfortunately, Obama did a very bad job in, in a sense of uh, uh, saying, okay, this is a cultural issues uh, for them. Don't get inter involved, uh, which I think is wrong. Uh, what do you mean? Don't get involved. We are there. You are there full forces, we are supporting them uh, financially, militarily, everything. No, 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 no. We cannot just say this is something cultural. If it is, it is cultural and it must be changed because there are elements in culture that are evil. They must, they must be changed no matter what. Yeah. Okay, Zane, you had a question? Oh, I was, um, you were, talk we were talking about the Trinity and I was, one of the thoughts I had was um, uh, the, the Navy hymn, Eternal Father, Strong to Save. Um, I've looked at it a few times. I, could, I come from a Navy family. Uh, the first three verses, each one is addressing a member of the Trinity and uh, something that they did in the Bible, uh, especially regarding water. And then the fourth verse, the final verse is just a praise of the Trinity. And it, I, I've never seen a more neatly organized hymn than all yeah. my life. And, and yeah. so I just wanted to give a shout out for that one there. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. As I said, yeah. you know, it's interesting. In fact, uh, there's a book, if you are interested to look, uh, read Church History. It's a paperback. It's kind of thick, but it's easy to read. Church History in Plain Language. And you can even order the audio format. I have both. Uh, sometimes when I'm driving long distances, I put the audio, just listen, and, and it's done very well. And in that book, it, the guy, the author mentions that if, when you look at church history, uh, the people went wrong on the concept of doctrine of Trinity. Um, now, maybe except areas, I'm not sure about that guy. But the others, they weren't evil people. They weren't like uh, some kind of a, a false teacher sitting, even though <laughs> they went wrong in their teaching of doctrine of Trinity. They weren't sitting, okay, let me come up with some kind of a uh, wrong definition of Trinity and confuse Christian. No, they weren't. They were trying to help. Like one of them was a pastor and he wanted to help his people uh, in, on, in their understanding of doctrine of Trinity, but his mistake was this. 
he went too far on that holy ground. When you are on that holy ground, all you can do is like Moses did. Take off your sandals, bow down and worship. There's nothing else you can do. If you try to put the triune God under a microscope and try to analyze it, it doesn't work. <laughs> you will end up somehow in some kind of a heretical teaching. So um, in other words, we can have good intention, but still end up in a, a wrong uh, conclusion. You can be sincere and sincerely wrong. But yes, I agree. As I mentioned, sometimes you find the, some of the best expression of Trinity in our old hymns. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm just thinking of how, how much good has actually come from the Western mind and critical analysis and philosophy and everything. And there's the tendency to, to want to answer every single question. And the thing is, like, we can answer almost every single question, but I think the journey may be that and perhaps the problem of evil, the two will we'll never, I mean, even have some answer for the problem of evil, but the Trinity, I think it's like, no matter how intelligent, no matter how scriptural, no matter how disciplined, there, there's just there's just a wall, you know. Yeah. I would say in defense of um, Western thinking, you, you know, there, it's good that, you know, in this analytical tendency, analytical uh, way of Western theologian philosopher, it's good because you can categorize, you can systematize, it helps you in understanding a concept. It's a reason of uh, advancement of science and civilization in the Western world. However, I would uh, like, again, going back to church history, I always tell to my student, there are certain things from Eastern church we can learn from though. I'm not everything because there are errors too, but um, the, you know, like John of Damascus was a, a, probably one of the greatest theologian of the Eastern church. And there are many things you can learn from him. Uh, you can learn, he has a great book on Islam that he calls it the heresy of Ishmaelites. And also, but he has a, a very interesting writings on Christian doctrines. And there is this, this aspect that uh, I'm not talking about mysticism. I'm not advocating mysticism. Please don't misunderstand me. But there is a mystery in Christian faith. And if we try too much uh, analyze thing, uh, we end up with some kind of, a, you know, silly, crazy ideas. Like, you know, the whole concept debate that has been going on, the Calvinism versus Arminianism, uh, you know, I believe in free will. I believe the Lord Jesus died for all people. But again, there are areas in the scripture, which I believe there's a mystery. There's a mystery anytime that you have God coming in contact with human being, God who is an infinite being coming in contact with a finite, finite being like us, there is tension and there's a mystery. And sometimes we just better leave it there. <laughs> okay, guys, anything else? Well, I enjoy these discussions very much. I hope you do too. And uh, please, if you have any question, feel free to send me email, or make a post on the Populi. If there's nothing else, we can uh, close with a prayer. Uh, Joshua, can I ask you to close our time with prayer? Sure. And we just thank you for being able to come together and um, study your word and study other faiths as it relates to ours. I pray that uh, we're able to witness to others and we're able to use what we're learning in this specific course, uh, just in the future. It's just not a study in studying, but something that will be useful in uh, helping to share the gospel with others. We love you. Help us to be faithful in our studies and help us to remember uh, what you would have us to remember. In your name. Amen. 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 Okay. Blessing up on all you guys. See you next week. All right. Thanks, Professor. Sure. Bye-bye.